Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Michael Roberts, Executive Director of Public Programs here at Asia Society, and I'd like to welcome you all to what I know is going to be a, a very uh, sobering uh, and important discussion about human trafficking in Asia. I'd like to thank, especially uh, thank the Asia Foundation for co-presenting this program with us and putting together this outstanding panel of experts. We uh, are delighted to collaborate with the, the foundation and look forward to doing so more in the future. I want to introduce you now to Carol Yost, who's the director of the Women's Empowerment Program at the foundation. She's here with us tonight and will introduce our very, very distinguished panel of experts. I think you all know that human trafficking is among the fastest growing criminal enterprises in the world. There are some very, very frightening statistics uh, from the 2007 State Department report on trafficking in persons, which uh, mentions that 800,000 men, women, and children are trafficked every year across international borders. This is an industry that's worth billions of dollars to the criminal economy that has grown up around it. There are some 12.3 million adults and children in forced and bonded labor or prostitution. And there's a prevalence of 1.8 uh, people per thousand worldwide, a number that goes up to three per thousand in Asia. So this is a very, very serious and uh, alarming problem. So tonight we hope to get a better understanding of the challenges to combating trafficking and to discuss some of the steps that have been taken to end and prevent it and to protect and support its victims all across the world and most especially in Asia. Before I turn over the floor to Carol and our panel, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping points. I just want to remind you that our program is being webcast tonight and uh, will be going out all over the world. So when we come to the question and answer period, please be sure to wait for the microphone so that your remarks can be uh, transmitted to all of our uh, listeners. I want to thank those of you who've already become members of the Asia Society for doing so, and I hope if you haven't that you'll think about joining us because we have some 120-odd programs a year like tonight's program, and uh, it's an extraordinary array of subjects that we deal with in all disciplines, and we'd love to have you back on a regular basis. Let me tell you about a few upcoming uh, and very, very interesting programs. We have of course, a wonderful exhibition by the contemporary Japanese artist uh, Yoshitomo Nara in our galleries downstairs, so we hope you'll come back for that. Next week, we have uh, uh, an outstanding literary program with the Chinese novelist uh, from Hong Kong, Xu Shi, the author of Habit of a Foreign Sky, which was a finalist for the Man Asian Booker award, literary award. Uh, we have a program on the 10th uh, about the president's upcoming visit to India. And uh, next Thursday evening, we have a wonderful new documentary film, Camp Victory Afghanistan, by Carol Deisinger, which looks at the uh, difficulties, the many challenges in, that face the US effort today in Afghanistan. So um, please do turn off any uh, cell phones or other devices that you may have that would make noise, and uh, join me then without uh, further ado in welcoming Carol Yost. Thank you. Michael, thank you so much. It's really a great pleasure for the Asia Foundation to co-host with the Asia Society on a program that is important to both of our organizations. The Asia Foundation, often when I'm in New York, when I say I'm with the Asia Foundation, everybody says, oh yes, I was at a program at the Asia Society last week. <laughs> so we're not uh, certainly as well known, we don't have this gorgeous building, but the Asia Foundation is headquartered in San Francisco, and we have 18 offices in Asia. We've been on the ground in Asia for more than 50 years. We support programs around uh, good governance, rule of law, access to justice, human rights, 
I direct the Women's Empowerment Program, as Michael mentioned. We work on economic reform and development, the environment, and some international relations. Most of the Asia Foundation staff is in Asia. 80% of our staff are Asian nationals who are experts in these areas that we work in. And uh, it's been my pleasure to work with people in each office for many years, uh, actually almost 20 years, uh, on women's empowerment issues. And about 15 years ago, trafficking in persons became such a huge issue um, for women and children and, and later we learned men across the Asia Pacific region that we began to, to work on the issue of trafficking. And it's uh, with pleasure that I uh, introduced Elise Nelson, who will be the moderator for a panel tonight, to get at some of the complexities of these issues, some of the things that are working, um, and then some questions and answers. Uh, Elise Nelson, as many of you know, is the president and CEO of Vital Voices Global Partnership. And she's one of the co-founders of this wonderful organization. And she is actually, they have had amazing conferences bringing together women from all regions so that they can raise their voices in the policy process to get their uh, problems on the table. And she's actually just returned from a wonderful conference in Asia that maybe she'll tell us a little bit about. So Elise, um, maybe I'd ask you to come up and introduce the panelists and they could join you um, up here at the same time. Let's see, is this, is this on? Do I need to turn it on? Or can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Great. Well, thank you all for coming out on election night. And um, you know, I realize there's a, a number of important issues on the table um, tonight uh, for our world, but we really appreciate you being here because certainly human trafficking is a major growing issue throughout the world. Thank you, Carol um, and Michael, both. Vital Voices has been really honored to partner with both of your organizations over the years. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here with this panel of experts. Vital Voices has actually been working on the issue of human trafficking for our entire 15-year history. It's an organization that believes strongly that this is one of the core impediments um, to really moving women, but quite honestly, humanity forward. Um, we've got to tackle this issue. We look at it really in three ways. We really identify and cultivate leaders around the world who are actually on the front lines of change combating human trafficking in the 127 different countries that we're operating in. We also look at forming networks of those leaders, because one of the things that we recognize is that the traffickers are very, very well resourced and very well networked. And that we, those people who are trying to combat human trafficking around the world, need to be just as well resourced and networked. We have a long way to go, a long way to catch up, but I think that evenings like this, to inform, to spread some of the good news, there is certainly sobering news, but there is some good news, some strides forward, um, I think is very important in, in really accomplishing that goal. The last thing that we do as an organization, Vital Voices, is we really look at advocacy. Um, we've been part of the legislation, and tonight, actually, this year, is the 10th anniversary of a law in this country to combat human trafficking, but more so to protect the victims of human trafficking so they are not victimized, first, by the traffickers, and second, by the system. So we're very involved in coalitions um, in this country and around the world uh, that work to raise awareness and to, to seek legislation, but even more so the implementation of that legislation. So let me just quickly um, introduce our panelists, and then I want to get into a real discussion here. I don't want to have speeches, <laughs> but really a, a discussion about the issues um, and, and hopefully to engage you in that discussion as well. So please be thinking about your questions, because I am going to come out to the audience in just a little bit here. So Mark Taylor, in the middle here, um, is a senior coordinator for reports and policy affairs um, at the Office to Monitor and Combat Human Trafficking at the US Department of State. I've known Mark for more than a decade, and he's been one of the good guys in the fight from the very beginning, and has been in his current job, I think, for seven years, right? It's probably one of the hardest jobs in the State Department, but we'll get to that. <laughs> um, Nandita Baruda is Chief of Party and um, in the Counter Trafficking in Persons Program for the Asia Foundation in Cambodia. So welcome to you as well. And um, Jean, Dr. Jean D. Kuna is Global Advisor on Migration for UNIFEM at the Uniform head, UNIFEM headquarters. And all of us know there's a lot of change going on right now. 
um, at the United Nations with the new UN Women um, entity, which I think is going to be very exciting. And of course, you've got a new great leader there in former president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet. So I want to hear a little bit about that as well. I want to start off with Mark um, to really, I think, give us um, the global perspective, but then really how does Asia fit into that perspective, some of the trends that you're seeing in the region right now. Thank you, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be back at, at Asia Society. Um, and thank you, Elise. Just want to throw, uh, talk a little bit about uh, Asia in the context of our work on international trafficking and put out a few trends that we've seen in the long and the short term. Just not uh -huh. uh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, as Elise noted, we just had our 10th. Uh, the tenth birthday of our law, which created our office and did uh, a number of other important things for the U.S. government, it criminalized the the cr uh, crime of modern slavery of trafficking in persons in all its forms, uh, and it funded uh, international programs that we administer around the world uh, and tie very closely into our into the trafficking in persons report that we also put out uh, for the tenth time. Uh, Asia, why is it so important for us? It, according to the ILO estimate on forced labor around the world, 12.3 of the 12.3 million victims, 77% are in Asia. Uh, and that seems to uh, complement other indicators of a more local level. The prevalence of trafficking also seems higher in Asia, with three out of every 1,000 inhabitants falling victim to some form of servitude. And of course, uh, in terms of global migration, and you'll hear more from Dr. Vicuna on that, uh, Asia seems to be the largest source of the over 200 million migrants that are in the, uh, in the global workforce. Three themes that are in our last trafficking report that we just put out in June that are very well represented in this region. One, the feminization of trafficking. In various parts of the world, but particularly in Asia, we've seen streams of migration that had been dominated by men or more uh, proportionally represented by men turning to women. And Indonesia is a great example where uh, just five years ago, over 60% of outbound migrants were men, and now almost 70% are women. Um, that, that's an astounding change, and it, it speaks to a vulnerability. Domestic workers and the unique vulnerability that they experience in the workplace most countries don't treat domestic workers as formal workers, and that unfortunately is true right here in the United States. Uh, they lack legal protections, they're socially isolated in a different culture, and they work and reside in the same premises and are extremely vulnerable to trafficking. We wanted to highlight that, and it certainly uh, affects a lot of uh, the populations in this, in this region. And finally, the, the fraudulent recruitment practices that are observed in many source uh, countries for migration, whether it be Bangladesh uh, or Thailand, Indonesia. The, the apparent growth in this, whether it's fi uh, pen uh, penalties for leaving a job early, debt incurred before departure, or just outright lies on what is uh, what are migrants to face down the road. Just quickly, 10 years in uh, a 10-year retrospective on the region and trafficking, brings uh, a lot of stories of success. Uh, countries where nothing existed 10 years ago in the fight on trafficking, and now there's a basic structure, whether it's laws on the first generational level, uh, brand new trafficking never being addressed before, or now even second generation laws, like in Thailand and Cambodia, where older laws that only dealt with women and children and sex trafficking are now taking on the full uh, gamut of, of trafficking offenses. Structures. Uh, committees, action plans, things that uh, incorporate civil society and partnerships are all on the rise. But unfortunately, we have too many challenges in the region, and the region um, is starting to fall behind with the rest of the world. This last report that we put out showed overall progress, with 23 countries moving up on our ladder of tiers, which we have to assign to countries, and 19 falling. But in Asia, unfortunately, it's, it's the opposite. We see 10 countries uh, falling and only three rising. And other indicators, uh, like the number of victims identified, seem very low. 
Uh, convictions for trafficking crimes around the world are on the rise, 40% last year, but in Asia they're actually falling, uh, at least in East Asia, I should say. So the, the concerns are, are pretty well outlined in, uh, in our report and I think by many of uh, the observers of trafficking, maybe some of you. Um, civil society collaboration is one of the key po areas that we're trying to promote. Uh, it's not something that can be legislated uh, or dictated, but without that partnership, we found that very little progress can be accomplished. Also, the lack of migrant protection, and, I, and my, my colleague will get into that more, but in many parts of Asia that serve as destinations for migrants, there is no safety net. There are no legal uh, channels for redress when someone faces abuse uh, or, or trafficking situations and that continues to be a hindrance. But I'll, find, I'll end on a, on a positive note, and that is that we, while the regional structures in Asia are also weak, they are growing. And we've seen some organizations like ASEAN uh, take on the issue for the first time, develop a working group, uh, now working towards a convention that will be the first in the region, uh, where other regions have had uh, similar structures for, for some time now. The commit process, which is in the... Uh, the Greater Mekong subregion brings together six countries uh, to address trafficking in, on mainland Southeast, Southeast Asia. And things like the Bali process that bring in a much larger number of countries uh, together to talk about migration challenges and, uh, and human trafficking. So overall, there's, there's been progress and there are a number of areas where, um, which are starting to be addressed, but there's still some major gaps uh, that threaten to widen. If, uh, if not addressed properly. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Building on what Mark said, Jean, maybe you could come in and talk a little bit about the link between human trafficking and migration in your work at the UNIFEM. Thanks very much, Elise. Uh, yes, yeah, so what are the links, some of the similarities and the differences between migration and trafficking? Well, one to begin with, migration is defined as people living or working perhaps temporarily or permanently outside the territory of the state of which they are nationals or citizens. And trafficking is defined as the receipt, the harboring, the transfer, the procurement of people by force, by coercion, by deception for the purposes of exploitation. That's one. Two, as Mark said, we're seeing the feminization of both migration and trafficking. Three, the sectors into which women move uh, either for, you know, by way of migration or trafficking are very similar because you have a bulk of women concentrated either in domestic work or in the <laughs> hospitality sector where they face gross human rights violations. Fourthly, facilitated movement characterizes both migration and trafficking. Fifth, the mainstream discourse, the mainstream practice on migration and the combat against trafficking largely is lacks a gender-sensitive rights-based perspective, though it's often targeted at women and girls. It lacks a rights-based development perspective. It's often framed by national serenity paradigms, national security paradigms, <coughs> economic paradigms, law and order paradigms, and it lands up violating the rights of women migrant workers and oftentimes trafficked women. There's very little attention that's paid to the demand side of the phenomenon, there's very little often attention paid to preventive measures, a lot of emphasis, important, but more emphasis on post-violation assistance. Whenever you do have preventive initiatives, they're often in the nature of micro-livelihood projects, which are not sustainable, they're not gender responsive, they're often not market responsive, and they only reinforce the susceptibility to distress migration or to trafficking. And lastly, there is a crying need for more multi-sectoral collaboration, more multi-stakeholder collaboration, both within and between countries of origin, transit, and destination. And the final point that I want to make here is that much trafficking occurs within the context of migration. And how? By number one, manipulating legal migration channels. You have an exacerbation of trafficking with shrinking job opportunities shrinking decent and legal jobs, particularly for women, or restrictive immigration and emigration policies. And trafficking also occurs within the context of migration 
by manipulating the vulnerability of persons concerned. That's economic, social, and emotional. And this forms a common basis for both distress migration and trafficking. And so I want to say that we need to place a lot more attention or provide a lot more attention to migration, to providing safe conditions for migration, because this does have a bearing, as Mark pointed out, on trafficking as well, which is not to say that specific attention, um, uh, you know, we, we move away from attention to trafficking, because the actors are different and there are specific interventions that need to be uh, introduced for trafficked persons as well. And UN Women does have strong migration programs on the ground, promoting the rights of women migrant workers, which has a bearing on trafficking, but we also have targeted trafficking interventions. Well, that brings up a good question. And will the new UN Women organization, will that be a major focal point? human trafficking, or will it stay in, in really with UNODC, or will there be a combination of the two working together? Well, we are in a process of transition, and UN Women will certainly continue to work, uh, as we have been told, on issues that we have been addressing. So violence against women is extremely important, but our executive director is in the process of consulting with different stakeholders and the directions of um, UN Women will be set very soon. But we are doing work on migration and we do have sub-regions that are doing work on trafficking. So we do hope that that gets uh, on the agenda in a big way. The links with ODC, I think we certainly need to collaborate with other UN agencies who are doing work on migration and trafficking. ODC comes from um, a, you know, a crime prevention perspective. That's perhaps not our comparative advantage, but we need to work with them. Mm -hmm. Our advantage would be more preventive and social, looking at policy issues, and that's where we would come from. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Great. Now I want to turn to Nandita, because I think we've gotten a great sort of global perspective and looked at some of the emerging trends. But working in Cambodia, um, as you do, I know, and there's some really interesting trends going on now in Cambodia. I'd like for you to talk about, just give us a snapshot of, of what's going on there around the issue. But then also talk about the new um, law that's been passed by the government, as well as this very high-level task force that the Cambodian government has put into place. I'm very curious, you know, is this just sort of lip service um, to a very serious problem, or is there actually going to be real action by the government? Thank you, Elise. I think um, both my colleagues have really laid the broader picture. And, and what I'm going to say is actually linked to what both Mark and Jean said. The issues that have been raised by the TIP report and by US government in other forums about trafficking, the fact that there are newer dimensions to trafficking, like you know, labor trafficking is a big concern, that, there is, that it's not just limited to women. There are more, you know, both men and women being affected that regional processes need to be addressed. Now, these are things which we are also seeing in Cambodia. Like Cambodia, it has had a huge amount of trafficking for sex work, yes. That's a big population of women and young children. But at the same time, I think what we are seeing in recent times is a lot of women and young people in Cambodia who are actually getting into an exploitative labor situation and end up being in trafficked uh, conditions and this is largely related to domestic servitude, women trying to find jobs outside of Cambodia and not having the means or the measure to ensure that they do it safely. That's a big challenge. The other challenge in Cambodia is also that sex trafficking is not just brothel linked. It's it's hidden under a whole other system of legit or semi legit entertainment industries like beer gardens, massage parlors, karaoke bars. So accessing people and rescuing them for situations of servitude in, you know, in industries which don't, you know, on the obvious side, look like sex work joints is a challenge. Um, and that's unlike in most other countries where actually a lot of the sex work and sex trafficking is very brothel based. Uh, you know, and in Cambodia, we see a much larger portion in these other sectors. Uh, it also brings the other gender dimensions because when women are in these sectors, it's a mix. Some of them are legitimate workers in this setting. So it's very difficult then to target an anti-trafficking program onto, say, the beer gardens or the karaoke bars, because then you would end up stigmatizing those who are probably even legitimately in those positions. That's a challenge in Cambodia. There is also a larger acceptance and prevalence of for the gender dimension being for men to have sex outside of marriage and pay for commercial sex. That's the demand which is fueling a huge number of young women and 
you know, children into the sex industry in Cambodia. Um, these are the bigger challenges, but at the same time, the government of Cambodia did pass a law in 2008, which has tried to address trafficking, and they placed the law within the Palermo Protocol. In addition to that, this year, the government of Cambodia also passed the penal code, which tried to strengthen the existing law. So there is a combination of legal provisions in place. Um, the challenge, however, is in implementing it. And as I said, the challenge stems from the fact that sites of trafficked victims are not clearly demarcated. So you can't just walk into a place and say, most women working in this situation are all trafficked. You know? And that comes into play in, in the implementation side. But um, having said that, I think the government of Cambodia is taking serious note of these emerging issues. It's, uh, it's tried to, you know, it's the only country in the South, uh, South Asian region which has actually passed a victim protection policy. It's got the national minimum standards on protecting victims' rights, which is being seriously implemented by Ministry of Social Affairs, who is now trying to train all social workers across Cambodia on what victim protection issues are. It's, uh, and the counter-trafficking project is working with the government in trying to implement this. They're trying to get to the NGO sector to work on this. This, this then brings to the question that what's the correlation between civil society and government? Because there is a part on, on this whole, you know, on this whole anti-trafficking and migration issue that the civil society has a much stronger role to play. But they cannot play it independent of the government. It has to be a coordinated effort. And that, that's where I think uh, Cambodia's success really lies in the fact that we have actually been able to set up the National Committee, which you talked about, which is a very high-level body. Uh, headed by the Deputy Prime Minister, and is, in, is not just interministerial from the government point of view, but it's also got government and civil society closely working. So structurally, I think that body is functioning in a way that allows for a much more collaborative relation for the civil society to step in where the government cannot provide the resources or the capacity to do it. And Cambodia is an emerging democracy. You know, it has a history of turmoil, of turbulence, and, and it's only been in peace for approximately 10 to 12 years now, so to say. So we are dealing with a situation where governance is really not the best and, and capacities of people who are on the enforcement side are fairly low. So a lot of attention now under this National Committee is being placed on building the capacity of the police force, of the judiciary, of the social workers who are key players in this entire set, you know, system. And I think um, at, at the final thing, I would also like to state here that what Jean said, the link between migration and trafficking, I strongly believe, and we are focusing, many of us, including the foundation and you know, organizations are, like IOM, are focusing on the fact that safe migration training, safe migration policies and information is a major preventive issue for trafficking. It's a part of a prevention program on anti-trafficking. If you train people on how to migrate safely, you probably prevent a lot of them for, from making unwise choices but some still will because it's linked to economics. Mm -hmm. You know, you will take risk if you don't have food on your table to go out. However, if you're informed, maybe even if you do end up in a bad situation, you still have some recourse mm -hmm. to what would I do if I'm ending up there. So these, uh, you know, these concerns are things that are getting addressed in Cambodia uh, with a number of close to 150 NGOs who are working on anti-trafficking, mm -hmm. 11 ministries who are coordinating closely. Uh, downside being, I think we still have issues with the judiciary and the conviction process. Mm -hmm. That's still very weak. So we do, you know, so the disparity is, and Mark would probably agree with that, that we have a lot of arrests. There are, you know, a number of cases which get picked up, but they don't necessarily get convicted. Mm -hmm. That's, that limitation is both based on the interpretation of the law and the systematic lack of uh, transparency within the judiciary. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's a cause of concern at this moment. And I think that's probably one of the major challenges that Cambodia will have to raise. And isn't it something like 62 countries around the world have never even convicted a trafficker, yes. ever? Yes. I mean, what do you say to those, those government leaders, considering that that's part of your job, <laughs> to tell them, well, you know, how they can do a better job? Yeah. Well, for one, we, we offer, um, offer up the Palermo pro uh, Protocol, which also is, is about to have its 10th anniversary as an international instrument mm -hmm. that's now been um, ratified by, I think it's 141 countries. 141, yeah. So the vast majority of the world has signed up to this definition of trafficking and these standards um, on uh, prosecuting uh, traffickers and protecting victims. And then we, we offer up our own experience, uh, the good and the bad. And we just rated ourselves for the first time in the 
and the TIP report, mm. um, a, a commitment made by our okay. secretary last year. It is tier one, it is the best uh, ranking, um, <laughs> and uh, that can cut both ways. But, uh, but the analysis behind it is quite frank. I mean, I think for a government document, we identify gaps in our own um, domestic efforts in the U.S., uh, particularly with identifying um, U.S. citizen children and trafficking. <coughs> and so we've been through um, some lessons, even though our experience is relatively young, mm. and we try to share that. Mm. Speaking about um, the global economic crisis and, and obviously the interplay there with prevention, I know in a place like Cambodia, there were so many um, garment workers, textile industry was hit so hard, and so much of that industry is made up of women. Yes. And so obviously then those women are forced to find work elsewhere and probably putting themselves into a situation potentially of greater risk. Absolutely. Has that increased the problem of human trafficking? It has. It has actually, in, well, I'd say that it has actually increased the level of uh, exploitation of women both mm -hmm. within the sex industry and in other forms of exploitative labor. I wouldn't say that there is, uh, there's been a direct cor corollary to say everybody who lost a job was trafficked. But majority of those who did lose a job ended up in a very exploitative sex work situation or in an exploitative mm. labor situation. You know? And sometimes it's a difficult line to draw. It, you know, it, it, it's easy to say that, oh, but she chose to be there. Well, she chose to be there because she didn't have an option. Right. You know? right. If she had it, she wouldn't choose to be there. Mm. And then once she is there, there are people who are ready to exploit her further and put her at greater risk. You know, and those, that's definitely been an observation. I think there have been studies done by UNAAP and other, which have seen an increasing number of women from the garment industry actually join you know, the so-called karaoke bars and the massage parlors and the bars yeah. in Cambodia. And is the government in Cambodia doing anything to address this? I think it's, very di it's, it's a difficult situation that governments in countries which do not have a lot of uh, resources and economic growth opportunities are faced with. So the best option they then they look for is that we need to start looking at where can we put these women to work in other countries. And then migration becomes a natural corollary for the government to say we need to start exporting human resources. However, if governance is not strong, then migration is a risk factor. And so though the government of Cambodia is trying very strongly to promote migration of its labor force to other countries, it's not fully equipped to ensure that it's safe. It doesn't have the legal structure or you know, sometimes even these social systems in place to make sure that these women are migrating safely. We have had recent cases where a number of young girls were actually uh, repatriated back from Malaysia who had gone there to, who had been sent there to work as domestic workers. Uh, the requirement being 21 years of age, which is what the Malaysian law stipulates. And these girls were 14, 15, 16, mm. you know? And so obviously they had documents which had been falsified, passports which have been, which didn't put their age correctly and were completely at loss when they ended up there because they were not equipped to handle that kind of work uh, pressure or the cultural change that they were facing. Mm -hmm. And so, so these are risks. And I think if we look at it, I, I, I think at one level you do see Cambodia growing economically well, but it still needs a lot more economic growth and resource to be able to employ the number of young people who are employable mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. And that applies to both men and women. And I think We've had serious cases of men who have ended up in traffic situation in fishing trawlers in Thailand, uh, you know, in bad labor conditions in other countries over the world. In fact, six were recently find of the, found off the coast of the Indian Ocean and who were dumped there by one of the fishing trawlers they were in because they raised, they, they protested or they wanted their money, so they were just dumped in a boat and left off the Indian Ocean and were picked up by the Indian Maritime Navy and then had to be repatriated back. 17 recently were picked up from Malaysia, of course, and brought back to Cambodia. So there are a huge number of, you know, I mean, these risks are, mm -hmm. are not going to be mitigated just, and again, I think it's important for us to say, sending and receiving countries are equally responsible. You can't hold one responsible and not hold Thailand responsible for not ensuring that those who are employing them are not bought under the Thai radar of law enforcement. Right. And so we, you know. Gina, are you seeing similar trends in terms of the, the if um, effect of the, the global economic crisis and the rise of migration and human trafficking? Um, yes, I wouldn't be able, well, I wouldn't be able to say that there is a direct correlation between the crisis and trafficking, but certainly there's more exploitative labor conditions. And I would agree that many countries in Asia, uh, poorer countries in Asia, are looking at migration 
as a development strategy mm -hmm. and are looking at remittances, you know, plowing back remittances through poor migrant workers into their economies. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that we are using. Well, we're not saying that labor migration should be promoted aggressively, but what we're saying is that if women from your country are moving, then you must protect them and you must have safe conditions for migration. And if women are remitting uh, remittances to your economies, and that has a macro effect, but it's also raising living standards, uh, you know, of uh, uh, health and education of children and community uh, standards, uh, living standards increase, then migrant workers must be protected because they are contributing to development. Mm -hmm. You know, considering that tonight is election night, um, I think I would be remiss to not talk about the fact that human trafficking is one of those issues that I think so many people, no matter what side of the aisle they're on, think needs to, to, to have an end put to it. And I think one of the reasons why human trafficking has moved forward so quickly in terms of the legislation, in terms of certainly in the United States being extremely serious about the issue, is because it has such great bipartisan support. And Mark, maybe you could talk to that. Um, how you think that the bipartisan support plays out, how it has been able to move the issue forward. You know, it, 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 it is truly remarkable, you know, the, the, the extent to the uh, to, of, of support that we receive um, from the from uh, all, all political walks in the U.S. You know, the the, um, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 um, passed unanimously, and there have been three amendments uh, to the law since then, um, showing the great congressional support an interest in the issue. We're forever receiving inquiries from the Hill um, about particular countries or trafficking in the United States. Um, there's been an increase in resources devoted to addressing victims' concerns here in the U.S. and in promoting awareness uh, abroad. Um, and uh, in, a, in a time when that kind of consensus is, is, is pretty rare, um, it continues. And it's it's been terrific to see since I've started working in 2003 the continuity from administration um, to administration, and uh, with very little uh, change in emphasis. Yeah, if, if I compare the issue of human trafficking to the other issues that that I work on, um, on violence against women, whether it be rape as a weapon of war or domestic violence or other culturally harmful practices, it has moved forward at such a huge pace. I mean, it's it's. It's unreal, and I really think that is because of the bipartisan support, but also I believe it's because it's never really been made a solely women's <coughs> issue. It is, you know, a law enforcement issue, you know, it's an organized crime issue, it's a human rights issue, it's a global security, it's a health issue. Maybe you could speak to the why is it so important that it maybe not be seen as just a women's issue, and why is it important also to bring different communities and sectors together to push it forward? I think uh, the fact is that it's not just a women issue. That's the truth. Yeah, It's about people being exploited. It's about women, men, and children being exploited. Uh, it's about really slavery, you know? And that's really been one of the reasons that it's ha had a larger support from a whole other segment of players. Mm -hmm. However, having said that, you will find, though, in, in most countries, the issue of trafficking is usually handed over to the women's ministry. And that's, you know, that has its plus and minus point. On one hand, it ends up focusing a lot on the issue of women who are in sex work or sex trade or sexual exploitation, yeah, or, or you know, women's migration. But on the other hand, because trafficking is a crime issue uh, with, which is organized in many ways, it needs the strong commitment and support of, say, mainland security guys or your law enforcement guys who are not necessarily always willing to work in tandem with women's ministries in most of the Asian countries, you know. And so the challenge is, has been, like in Cambodia, uh, initially the National Committee, for example, was with the women's ministry. And it hadn't made much headway in any of the prosecution or enforcement issues. But in the last year and a half, it has been moved to the Ministry of Interior. Mm. And since then, the level of commitment and movement we have seen on most cases has been tremendous, you know. Which is also, I mean, it, it's also unfortunate from a gender point of view. So it's almost like if it's a women's issue, the rest of the society is not going to pay any attention. Yeah, that's unfortunate, but yes, that also happens to be the hard truth in many countries where I think it's easier for them to address, is, uh, address this as an enforcement issue. Again, if you look at the demand and supply side of it, you know, the supply is always the women and the demand is coming from the men. 
in the sex industry at least. Mm -hmm. And so there are a level of discomfort sometimes mm -hmm. in, in it being addressed uh, by other segments within governments. Mm -hmm. so I think uh, that's, that's, those are challenging issues, but I think Jean would say probably even when you know, Unifem's worked on anti-trafficking issues, we've had to face this challenge in all Asian countries, not mm -hmm. just in Southeast Asia. Jean, mm -hmm. did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I wanted to reinforce what uh, Nandita is saying, but I also wanted to add that uh, trafficking is very much a rights-based development issue, very complex, very multi-layered. It's mm -hmm. mediated by a whole lot of interacting socio-economic, cultural, political issues, and therefore it needs multi-pronged strategies. So you have to work at it from the, the point of view of economic rights and security, macroeconomic trade policies, livelihoods initiatives. You have to work at it at the level of education, consciousness raising, mindset change. You have to work at it from the point of view of crime, law and order, uh, prosecutions. Um, uh, so that's the whole gamut of, of interventions. But the other thing that I want to say is that we need to look at it uh, from a gender-sensitive rights perspective. And when I say gender-sensitive rights perspective, I would say men, women, girls, and boys are trafficked. Uh, the experience of each one of these sets of people is different, mediated by an interaction of class, ethnic, nationality, gender marginalization. And um, uh, you know, you would see perhaps that women and children bear disproportionate discrimination or undergo disproportionate discrimination in that whole trafficking circuit. So it's not just women specific, but women and children perhaps are more disadvantaged. And there are certain sectors into which men go where they're also very disadvantaged. So I think you need to have a gender perspective uh, on the issue and address it as a comprehensive development issue. I want to open it up to the audience for any questions that you might have. Yes, in the back there. Yep. Um, this, this, uh, question Actually, I think we'd like you to introduce yourself. Just uh, wait for the microphone. Hi, my name is... Uh, Hello, yeah. This, uh, my name is Lulu Jo from Friendship Across Frontier. And I, this question is to Mark Taylor to address the uh, uh, human trafficking issue in China, specifically <laughs> for the Fujie and Zhejiang people because they are among the uh, world's most are willing to pay for uh, illegal immigration, especially to countries like United States and Europe. So for market economy, when you face such a great demand that are willing to pay, uh, most likely they will end up here in one way or another. So I would like to ask you about whether there will be, since Americans are welcoming investors from all over the world, whether there will be a legalized uh, way for them to come here in the future um, instead of paying huge amount, tens of thousands of dollars to the human traffickers. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Fujian certainly is, has made a, a name for itself in the, in the migration world. Um, but I think it's important when we look at the phenomenon of, of human trafficking uh, to draw a clear distinction between people smuggling and trafficking. Uh, and uh, it's, it's the basically the, the, the role of the person who's doing the migration. Are they complicit uh, or um, in collaboration? in moving across borders and violating a country's immigration laws, um, or are they being um, deceived, coerced, forced um, at any stage of the, of the process, whether it's you know, from recruitment when they met uh, in Fujian would be the snakehead and, uh, and signed that deal, or even arriving uh, after that journey, after having known um, that they were violating laws and paying all this money to get around uh, enforcement agencies. You know whether they are in a coerced situation. You might recall um, just briefly the the Golden Venture, a boat that ran aground on uh, on Long Island. I think it was in '95 or '6. I think that today, um, about 15 years later, some of those um, people who paid up to fifty thousand dollars to come to the United States would have been classified trafficking victims. Um, that's a personal uh, perspective, but 
there, there clearly is a correlation. Uh, people that take those kind of risks and that get themselves into that kind of debt are highly vulnerable to exploitation. And so the core, I mean, that, that's just seen time and time again. But yet, that act of, of, of being smuggled, of, um, of moving, is not in itself trafficking. And, uh, and we try to draw that line. It's, it's a really tough um, division, um, particularly for immigration agencies. Our own ICE um, agents face that uh, struggle. Just on the issue of China and, and in a number of other countries um, throughout Asia, about, I don't know, three or four months ago, I think it was March of last year, The Economist magazine, many of you may have seen it, they ran a cover story called Gender Side. And it was basically the problem of the fact that millions of girls, um, baby girls, are basically aborted yeah. because of their sex. And now there is this whole rise of actually human trafficking because there are no <laughs> women, <laughs> there are not enough women basically to, to be wives in, in many of these countries. And uh, I just wonder, you know, is that an issue that comes up in your work, um, and and what is the response? It, it does. Um, we wrote a short article on it two years ago on the gender gaps in the in the world's two largest countries, India and China, um, and it's it appears to be widening. Um, it'll be very interesting. India's um, uh, producing its uh, its census this year. It does it every ten years. It'll be interesting to see if the gap widens in places like the Punjab and Haryana, where Right, it's been as high as about what seven sixty uh, female births for a thousand Absolutely. male births, mm -hmm. uh, but for totally different reasons. In India, it seems much more cultural and uh, in, a, in a societal value placed on the male child, mm -hmm. and China, it's more linked to state policy on family um, uh, size, um, and so that's a, a more delicate issue, I think, when you're getting into the state policies um, related to this. But there clearly is a cause and effect, and we are seeing the trafficking of young brides from places like Burma and Vietnam into as far north as Heilongjiang up in the northeast of China uh, because of the, the, the scarcity of brides. And I think that's pretty prevalent even within Cambodia and Korea. That's a big issue. Yeah, thank you. Yes, right here, second row. Yes. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Lilia. I live in New York. I was wondering if anyone can address the role of the U.S. military bases in Asia and, and the effects of the presence of the military bases in Asia on the, the whole issue of trafficking. Nandita? Well, you are the U.S. government That's representative right. here. <laughs> It's a reluctant but familiar <laughs> role. Um, yes, uh, I think we, we've had uh, a bit of experience now. I mean, like I, I should emphasize, you know, the, our, whole, our whole experience on trafficking has been relatively short in terms of addressing it earnestly through, uh, through coordinated strategies. But we've seen um, trafficking and prostitution, of, of course, around bases uh, like those in, uh, in Korea and in Japan. And the military has, uh, the U.S. military has um, devised a policy, a zero tolerance approach to servicemen and women engaged in uh, sexual exploitation or trafficking. Um, so there's a whole, I, I, I'm most familiar with the enforcement around the, the bases in Seoul, um, that there are uh, prop places that are um, set off limits because there's been information received uh, and that's collected actively uh, on trafficking. And, uh, and there's, an, there's an effort to identify any service man or woman who's involved and punish them. Um, that's, it's been going on for I think about four years now. Um, so. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Daniel Lukes, I'm from NYU, and I would just like to ask if any of you can speak to the issue the intersection of uh, global sex tourism and human trafficking. I mean, what if we... I think uh, I can just, yeah, I think uh, in, if I take the example of uh, Cambodia, Cambodia actually saw an, ex, you know, very high proliferation of pedophile activity in recent times, where many Western uh, 
sex tourists actually came to Cambodia because it was so much more easier and less risky to sexually exploit minors. Um, and I think Cambodian government actually responded by taking some of these cases very seriously. And we have had prosecutions. And strangely enough, in these cases, the prosecution has been pretty fast and pretty quick uh, to as high as like 17 years of, uh, you know, of some of these people being prosecuted. There's also been one very big case where the perpetrator was an American and he was being, he's been extradited now and the case is going on here. And I think with sex tourism cases, it's the two things which we have lessons learned is important. That the country from where the perpetrator comes, there has to be a strong message by those countries to their citizens who are going out into other countries thinking that these are easy country to find a prey, uh, that you will not be tolerated in your home country. And, and extradition treaties are very important because sometimes in less developed countries when it's sex, you know, sex tourists can get away by paying money. And that's when I think it becomes important for home countries to really drill the message in and seek extradition and ensure that the perpetrators are punished. Sex tourism also happens where I think there is a laxity of law sometimes and there are, there is a larger population of vulnerable young people available. Mm -hmm. And that's something which is also true for Cambodia. There are a lot of young people who are migrating to the cities because seeking employment. There are a lot of young children st staying on the streets, let's say, who are vulnerable to being exploited. And I think uh, it's, it's also linked to the fact that states need to have policies to protect minors, protect young people. And unless you do that, I think it's very easy to proliferate. And, and for Cambodia, I have to give credit to the government of Cambodia. I think they are very conscious that they do not want to be seen as a sex tourism destination because it's not going to bring them the necessary revenue that tourism does mm. otherwise. <laughs> so it's actually going to take away from Cambodia the revenue it needs as a tourist destination to grow. Mm. And, and that's a message that's being proliferated through its tourism ministry. So it, it has to be addressed at all these levels, I think. Well, you know, we've talked about the government and the government's role. We've talked about NGOs. We've talked about international institutions. We haven't talked about the private sector. I know right. there have been a number of um, tourism companies. Carlson, for example, has really stepped forward in a very big way on this issue. Mm -hmm. What do you think the role, each of you, what do you think the role of the private sector ought to be in combating human trafficking? What is it their responsibility? Certainly the tourism industry, but, you know, certainly the, the labor, you know, yeah. market yeah. as well. I mean, I know Levi Strauss and yeah. others have, have really looked at sort of some supply chain issues. If any of you can respond to that, it would be very interesting. Jean, would you like? No, when you talk about global sex tourism, I mean, uh, you know, there are, s there are so many sectors involved. You have the airlines, you have your transport, you have your hotels, you have, uh, and, uh, and you have your entertainment industry, your, uh, uh, you know, bars and all of that. So it's very complex and it's very interlinked and there are backward and forward and vertical and horizontal linkages. And um, I, it's so complex that, um, you know, you don't know where to start from. And there needs to be uh, mindset changes. There have to be codes of ethics. There has to be policy and legislation. Um, uh, there has to be an, a new understanding of tourism and sustainable mm -hmm. tourism. So I think it has to be tackled, you know, from all these angles. I think to add to what Jean said, uh, it's important, like she said, it's also important what are we doing societally to monitor uh, as both consumers, uh, you know, of goods and products from companies who are producing in, in less developed countries. For example, Gap had a big issue some years back uh, on their production chain. And I think that's where companies need to step in and say, you cannot not take responsibility by saying that it was sublet to somebody else. It, it becomes your moral responsibility, responsibility to say whether your producer is producing it in-house with legitimate labor or, like it happened in this case, is subletting out to somebody who has got 10 minor children who are actually producing in his backyard. You know? And that kind of monitoring and governance becomes very important for all big companies to do. We were hearing Ambassador Lucy DeBaca speak yesterday about the fact that most of the products from the sea coming in from Thailand and other places, the shrimp industry that we are all consuming, large percentage is based on enslaved labor. Mm -hmm. So how are we as a, you know, as a consuming country going to respond to that? You know, and so it, it ha there has to be pressures from all sides. And I do know that the private sector 
in some places has taken responsibility. In Cambodia, for example, we have a system whereby most hotels are now today signing up to be child safe. You know, and so they have to be a part of the system where they would have to say, okay, we're child safe and put out those policies. And as development sector partners, it, it then becomes a responsibility that if I'm holding a conference, I need to verify whether I'm holding, doing my business with a child safe hotel or not. You know, little things, but goes a long way. There's a lot of push to have this conference in this hotel and that hotel. And I'm like, are you, have you signed on to the child safe policy? Do you follow those rules? If not, this is not happening. It's a business deal for them. And they don't want to lose business, you know? Yes, second row here. Uh, my name is Craig Sharman from Manhattan. Um, I think my question is directed to you, Mark, but anyone who wants to possibly uh, answer it. Uh, so you spoke rather favorably that uh, the issues that you're dealing with are gotten good bipartisan support and that the transition from one administration to the other has been very, quite smooth. Now, this is an election day, and we know that one of the most hottest non-bipartisan issues people deal with in this country is immigration. So where is, where is the line break down? Where immigration, nobody gets along on, nobody can agree on, but you get good bipartisan support on the issues that you're dealing with. Because there's, there's, an, there's not obviously a consensus on, on immigration issues and, and also the reality of, of what trafficking is. You know, we, we, we try to emphasize the exploitation element of trafficking recognizing that it is enmeshed in migration and in many other things. And trafficking seldom uh, uh, exists alone. Um, but it's not smuggling, and, um, and that's why we tend not to get into that debate. Um, a lot of time could be spent on that, and you know, we, have, we might have views um, on, uh, on particular immigration policies, but without a direct nexus into, into a trafficking element, um, you know, we try to stay away from that. Now, the big exception is I mean, immigration systems, and ours included, should give anyone who's a victim of trafficking access to, to legal redress. And that's enshrined in the Palermo Protocol. Uh, it's in our law that you know, regardless of legal status, regardless of how someone arrived in a country, um, what they did, whatever unlawful acts they might have committed as part of being trafficked, they deserve protection they deserve um, a court to look on their complaint favorably. So, that, and that's, that's the rub. That's, but, and, and that's very often difficult to explain to foreign governments. And we're, we're not saying you, because a lot of governments are very afraid of um, um, migration issues, as <laughs> I'm sure you know. And in some parts of the world, the word immigrant and migrant are the same word, and it gets very confused. So, but that's the key for us, is that there needs to be a credible avenue for victims of trafficking to follow for um, to redress their crimes. Yeah, Nancy Camel, Vital Voices board member and longtime anti-trafficking advocate. Exactly. <laughs> and I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, but if you listen to uh, UNODC, their statistic on prosecution is incredibly different from what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that uh, there is a very, very uh, major gap in all governments, including ours, addressing this, and I think their percentage is under 10% of, of known criminals get prosecuted. They also indicate that very often, as I believe was brought up in the conference, in the presentation, that um, the police force itself is complicit in many nations. What could we do? If we do have a 40% average, which is the first you know, I mean, that would be wonderful, but that's not the statistic that's being bandied around, at least at the UN. If we do have a good percentage of prosecution, what can we do to do best practices around the world? What kind of communication is being held? The Palermo uh, is a concept, <coughs> but it's not necessarily uh, enforced or enforceable broadly. Okay. Oh, it's a, uh, I'm sorry if I misspoke. Uh, I was referring to a 40% increase over the previous year in, in convictions. They're still abysmally low, uh, 4,000 convictions mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, and if you take the ILO's estimate, which is a minimal estimate of, of forced labor and sex trafficking of 12.3 million, that's 0.0003% of trafficking crimes being actually addressed. <laughs> so um, you, know, you make a very good point. And complicity is actually something, it's always the the gorilla in the room that, uh, that no one wants to really talk about. 
it's 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 an intangible often it's hard to to, to pinpoint and it's often very dangerous to talk about it in a place like Cambodia um, but that is hugely um, uh, corrosive to anti-trafficking efforts when police are not just not carrying out anti-trafficking efforts but are part of the problem if they would just do no harm that would be half of the solution right there <coughs> but no in too many parts of the world this is a very lucrative industry and it hasn't had and prior to this whole international movement there hasn't really been a deterrence um, so when moving somebody and selling them into sexual slavery will will net you you know ten to fifty thousand um, dollars and 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 uh, the chances of being punished are very slim why not a lot of people are opting for that instead of drug trafficking arms trafficking Statistically, many uh, people who have been trafficked turn around and become traffickers themselves. What do you all think is this psychological or the, the ramifications of that kind of cycle? You want me to take that? I think uh, it, it's, it depends on when, what was the person trafficked into and how long did the person remain in a traffic situation? And usually, statistics show that those who have been trafficked into the sex industry, most women, if they have stayed three to four years and more, end up becoming complicit in that crime because they have given up the hope of another option in life. And they see this as a way of really <coughs> making actual money in the business instead of just selling sex themselves. Um, I, I, I don't have any studies from within the Southeast Asia to say how, how large that percentage is because as I said, in, you know, in Southeast Asia it's less brothel based and more people moving. Um, but in South Asia there ha definitely has been larger trends on this. The other thing is that in most, most of the traffickers, it's, it's a different level. The first point of contact is not really a part of the bigger organized gang. It could be just a first timer or a second timer. It is. The second and, or the third point of contact who's actually a part of the more organized system. Because the first point of contact has to be somebody who the victim trusts. You know, so it'll have to be somebody from the village, the neighborhood, an aunt or an uncle, uh, you know. And many of them just actually do it maybe one time, you know, or maybe two times uh, in that sense. And so whether the question then is that within the prosecution system, where do you place this person who is then more easily caught once the person is received than the other two who just disappear, you know. So that's, and then to say that whether this person is there for, and this, the person who are recruiters in that are not necessarily being trafficked themselves. They are just contact people who they know can be brought and be vulnerable. So it's, it's a difficult, uh, you know, statistically it's difficult to prove whether anybody, everybody who's been trafficked is going to become a trafficker. It's not necessarily but what we did find in India when we did a study is that many women who have stayed in the sex industry for four years plus do become complicit to bringing in a second and a third person from their village. Yes in the back there. Hi my name is Jake from Human Rights Watch um, and I wanted to piggyback on the issue of complicity and ask uh, Nandita um, what the numbers are in terms of your capacity building of the police force and what measures um, you take to measure the effectiveness of the police force? The police training in Cambodia, specifically on the trafficking, has only happened post the anti-trafficking law, which came up in 2008. So it's less than a year and a half old, really. And there have been multiple organizations who have been doing training on different aspects of, uh, you know, of the law. Okay, now. Our experience is that the capacities of the police in Cambodia, even on basic investigation, have been so poor, uh, which is one of the reasons that many of the times when they do end up arresting, their investigation and their logging of investigation uh, is so poor that the court, it's very easy for the court to overrule it just on that, without even you know, getting into any complicity. It's, it's been so pathetically poor. So our, uh, we have, you know, from the counter-trafficking project's point of view, the Asia Foundation, We've been working largely with uh, not, not just the anti-human trafficking unit, but the CNP on, on, ex on expanding the capacity on the criminal investigation process. Um, as you might know that in Cambodia, the anti-human trafficking police is a specialized unit which has about 750 police officers. And frankly, all these 750 have been trained by someone or the other 
in some aspect of the law. That does not make them better equipped to deal with the issue, you know, because it's not been a comprehensive or standardized training. And that's what I think Cambodian police is now striving for. The move is that you really need to have a standard protocol. Last month, the government of Cambodia passed the, you know, under, you know, we worked with that, passed the standard operating procedure or the policy on raid and rescue, a, a rights-based victim-centered policy. So we are hopeful that now that this policy has come into place, maybe in two to three years' time, we probably would be better equipped to measure whether the police are actually protecting the victims or further violating them during this process of rescue. In terms of whether the number of trainings that people have received have been effective, I think it's a little early for us to do that. It's a little early in a year and a half to see whether what you have trained, and not even, I would say, about maybe 20 to 30 percent of the total police force has actually been given some decent training to say that whether they are following up on this system. Uh, uh, I think it would be interesting actually to pick up what you have said three years from now and see how effective that training has been in keeping them away from being complicit. No, I think there's a whole package of measures here. It's not just, well, training is one in terms of law, because when I was doing research in India, for instance, and I was talking to police officers, they didn't even know the law had been changed. So training in investigation measures, training on the law, training on a gender-sensitive rights perspective, I think there has to be reform even within the police force in terms of their conditions of work, in terms of salaries. Uh, this training has to be institutionalized, you know, and they, it cannot be one-off trainings. Uh, there has to be accountability mechanisms in place for uh, police officers who violate the codes or violate the standing opera uh, standard operating procedures. Uh, so it has to be a whole package, including their conditions of, uh, of work. And very often, I mean, it's a typical male mindset, you know, particularly for sex trafficking. I mean, so what? I mean, this is, you know, a done thing. So there's a lack of political will to even implement because of a certain male-centered mindset. Yes, yeah. Yeah, my name is Karen. But with the male mindset, is there any effort nationally or internationally to either prosecute or, or educate or modify the behavior of the Johns in case of sex trafficking, for example, or I don't know, um, the recipients of domestic labor force, for example? There are a whole plethora of, of uh, initiatives that are being undertaken in various parts of the world, and I can speak to it from Asia, where, um, for instance, uh, there are initiatives called, this was in, in Bangkok, in Thailand, where they had this hotline foundation, which was actually initiated for women who were victims of violence, but they got uh, men who were callers in, who were actually saying, you know, we are perpetrating violence, we don't want to do this. So it was a counseling service, it was a referral service, and then they used to do media programs speaking on different aspects of violence against women, including sexual violence, prostitution, and the like. And there would be, you know, callers in on the program. Uh, so that's one. The other thing is working with school students and youth. And I think that's the, a long haul, but it's extremely important uh, to talk about, um, uh, you know, these issues openly and to have school programs, to have zero tolerance schools, where, whether it's you know domestic violence or sexual violence, uh, because you have to start with children when they are young. I do know that in San Francisco, there was also um, a program with uh, clients, um, uh, you know, I, either um, clients of women in prostitution or rapists, where they were talking about either doing community service or going through some form of counseling. So there are these initiatives, but they have to be brought to scale, and it has to be widespread. They are tiny, scattered initiatives, you know, in different sites. Yes, in the back, in the white. Hi, uh, my name is Malika, NYU. Um, my question is directed to uh, Jean. You brought uh, an issue of remittances, and um, in a country like Philippines, where they heavily rely on remittances, <laughs> Uh, where government puts their interest before uh, the migrant or the traffickers. My question is, what do civil societies do to pressure the government to create a job inside and, uh, you know, to put the interest of migrants first? Thank you. Well, you know, there is work being done by civil society. <coughs> Uh, there is work which is being done on trade policies, on macroeconomic policies, you know. 
um, uh, but you're fighting a huge, huge battle. That's uh, and you know with not too much of success. Um, with respect to remittances, we do know of groups of migrant groups who have been advocating with um, uh, financial companies, uh, you, you know, with these transfer companies, money transfer companies, to reduce transaction costs of the remittances to ensure that these remittances sent by migrant workers are safe, are secure, are delivered. We also know of migrant groups that are working on savings mobilization with migrants, you know, to be able to save and remit. Uh, we also know of groups, migrant groups, who are talking about productive investment of migrant remittances and training and, you know, have uh, in dialogue with families back home. And it's not just business enterprise because not all migrants, you know, have a flair for business. But there has to be a change in the way you look um, at business development as well because what we're seeing on the ground and, you know, UN Women did support uh, migrant initiatives on the ground with respect to productive investment. But what are we doing? We are going to government departments. Government departments are giving them training. It's old hat training, stereotypical training, not market responsive, small scale little projects which are bound to fail. You have to have feasibility studies. You have to look at local resources. You have to think differently. With It has to be responsive to market conditions. You have to make a connect between you know, your local situation and your macroeconomic policies. If you're going to introduce you know, these little livelihood programs of making plastic packets and paper bags, it's bound to fail. You're, you know, these are poverty-ridden initiatives which are going to reinforce poverty. So there has to be different ways of doing things. Um, or other kinds of investments, uh, investment packages for migrants. So I think these are issues that need to be addressed uh, more seriously. And, you know, there needs to be a link between different constituencies. For instance, people working on the issue of migration and trafficking need to work with people who are working in the, uh, in the area of economic rights and security, need to work with people working on the issue of other forms of violence. Otherwise, we're working in silos, and that bigger coordination is not happening. Yeah, in the back there on this side. Thank you. Uh, Jeshi Bajoria from the Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you so much for this interesting <coughs> panel. Um, I'm wondering if you could discuss what kind of impact demographic challenges in Asia, Asian populations and some East Asian countries and booming youth populations in many South Asian countries might have on migration and by correlation on human trafficking. And if there are any concerning trends, what kind of initiatives or steps that are being taken to address them? Thank you. Yeah, there are huge <laughs> um, uh, impacts of changing demographics because as you see, number one, an aging population. There is a demand for um, caregivers. Uh, aging populations in richer countries of employment where or um, women, middle class women in richer countries of employment uh, who are being uh, recruited into the labor force. Now, if you don't have, you know, adequate child care facilities, if you don't have, uh, 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 you know, subsidized facilities for domestic work, if you don't have a mindset change where there's shared responsibility between men and women or other members of the family to engage in domestic work, if you have, um, you know, fewer children to care for older people, then there is a demand raised for domestic workers and for caregivers. And then you have a movement of people from, uh, you know, and where you have people in richer countries enjoying social security or better jobs or not wanting to engage in the 3D jobs. You have a movement of people from poorer countries, labor surplus countries, to these countries, um, you know, to, as caregivers, as health workers, as domestic workers. And we've seen that in Singapore, Hong Kong, you know the richer countries in Asia, and then across from the south to the north as well. And do you see that resulting in more human trafficking? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be able to give you statistical data, but certainly within that, you would see trafficking occurring because, you know, you'd be promised a job as a domestic worker, but you'd go into the sex sector, you promised a, a, certain, uh, um, uh, a certain wage, certain conditions of work as a domestic worker, but you land there and you find, you know, you're looking after 10, Ten households, and you're not just doing cooking, but you're doing also, you know, washing of cars and a whole range of other things, and that's violation of the terms of contract. If I could just uh, just add that we, one thing we've dis that we've learned uh, in in, uh, in in that area is that basic labor rights, minimum wage, the right to a day off, um, basic protections, 
our key form of prevention for human trafficking. Um, we've got to look beyond that, that narrow focus on you know, identifying trafficking and the conditions that, uh, that cause it and, and go out to, to uh, structures, um, the lack of a structure really on a lot of the migration flows that are legal. And that's been the big astonishment for us is that so much trafficking is occurring through contractual migrants that are completely legal. They have passports, visas. Um, there's even some government to government arrangement. Um, but there's nothing that really pr protects the, the workers themselves. It's all sort of a mi migration management flow. Um, well, we all know there are serious challenges <laughs> with this issue. And we are far away um, from, from getting to any sort of solution. But we also know that there are many bright lights around the world, great leaders on the front lines of change who are implementing incredible strategies and really making change and making progress. What I'd love to do to just close the panel, and then I know we're going to have a reception. I know there are many more questions in the room, and we can, we can get to those in the reception time. But maybe if I could just have each of you, if there's one great successful strategy that you have come across in your many years of working on the issue, that you would love to see taken to scale, you'd love to see replicated, you'd love to see better resource. Just one thing that is working when it comes to human trafficking. Nandita, do you want to start? Sure. I think uh, one of the biggest uh, challenge and one of the things that most countries where ha human trafficking work has worked or has moved ahead has been when you have actually been able to formalize a working relationship between the government and the civil society. Mm -hmm. And that really has gone in, in the way of really creating an enabling environment to provide both services as well as enforcement. And I think uh, if I look at that, whether we are looking at, you know, in India or whether we're looking at in Cambodia, and now I think, you know, in some of the other countries in South Asia as well, um, setting up a mechanism which allows for that collaboration, which is official, which is structured, uh, is a success. And I think in Cambodia, if I look at it, the fact that the National Committee today is an official structured body which has both civil society and government representation in a formal policy sub-decree setting is a success. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say that even while one was working in, a, in, in South Asia, it was when you had mechanisms, whether be it a network of NGOs which actually had an official representation within a government forum. Uh, you know, in, in, in India, for example, the ATSEC had an official representation within the advisory board in the Ministry of Women's Affairs on anti-trafficking. Many policies got through much more smoothly. So I think to me that, that really is a major uh, impetus to, of success to say. And then other things follow. I mean, other services, uh, you know, enforcement, those become the responsibility of individual entities or individual ministries then to do. But this voice, from, from the civil society and this effort of the civil society when it's recognized and merged with the official enforcement is really a, a big parameter of success. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. Mark? Yeah. I think you know, it's understandable that a lot of attention is placed on getting people out of situations of slavery, whether it be forced prostitution or forced labor. But there's far less attention on the long-term uh, mm -hmm. rehabilitation or reintegration of, of victims. And what I've seen just really um, stunning, but it's very localized, is when NGOs put the time and effort into that, into giving micro uh, loans to survivors to let them get back on their feet and find partnerships with the private sector to get them employment. And there's some really interesting things that have happened in India, in Cambodia, like Hagar, an NGO there that set up a factory on so for, to create soy milk and created some really high-end uh, fabrics. Uh, that are sold uh, internationally. It's, there's no you know, one particular thing that works everywhere, but NGOs that are, that are you know, creating these partnerships and investing in that long-term uh, care that's and really I know necessary. That Secretary Clinton is now, well, she was in Cambodia. She, Cambodia. Cambodia. she yeah. probably isn't there today because she <laughs> was there yesterday, um, or two days ago, I guess, and I know she was visiting with Somali moms um, uh, work CMA, there. Right. Many of you may know of uh, the wonderful advocate to combat human trafficking, Somali mom, who herself is a survivor and is trying to create a culture of, of, of survivalhood for many, many more girls. So, yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll talk very briefly about uh, um, community uh, networks of migrant workers mm -hmm. who are also yep. dealing with the issue of trafficking. And through our UN Women programs, we catalyzed these uh, both in Nepal and in Indonesia. 
um, 10 districts, across 10 districts in Indonesia and in, then in Nepal as well. Uh, so they are men and women migrant workers. What do they do? They've been collecting data with the local vil uh, village government at the local level, sex disaggregated data on who moves out, you know, and where and for what. They've been doing community awareness raising on the costs and benefits of migration and the ploys that traffickers use. They have piloted together with the Brahavajaya University, this is in Indonesia, uh, they've piloted a pre-departure training program which is done locally. You have returned women migrant workers who are resource persons in that program. They are running a radio service, information dissemination to these communities, source communities, on, the, on safe migration and the rights of migrant workers. They have been given paralegal training and they are handling cases. Now, this is not all hunky-dory and perfect because there are lots of resource deficits uh, or capacity deficits. But they are handling cases of trafficked persons and abused migrant workers coming back home. And they are doing it through referral services that we have tried to generate for them because UN Women can't do everything. So other NGOs, trauma counseling centers that help them to, to uh, fight these cases. Community vigilance committees. So they've actually pushed illegal recruiters out. They've blacklisted, they've handled, you know, sort of circulated among themselves uh, recruiters who have violated women not to go back to those recruiting agencies, etc. They have inputted into policy. And one of the best policies I have seen at local level is in the district of Vitar, where communities of migrant workers, women and men, the, the university, local government have all inputted into that law, so extremely participatory. They're also doing livelihood projects. So I would say I would see this as a good practice strategy and something good for several reasons. In the context of decentralization, it's extremely important to have local government doing work because, number one, your local government can get, go any which way. And then, you know, you can actually access services at a local level. Poor people can. So that's very important. Secondly, I think this is a very good example of um, pilots that have built into the pilot design your um, uh, guarantees for replication. Because right through the pilot, they had 13 other governors coming to those meetings and they were selling the idea, etc. So this is being replicated in other sites, including the World Bank is replicating it and they want a target of 80 community-based networks. ILO is uh, replicating it. The national government has come to see the pilot, so it's being taken to scale. It's integrated because they are talking about livelihood, they are talking about law, they are talking about vigilance committees, they're talking about education, so it's integrated. And I would say it's very good because it's an example of ownership. It's a, an example of sustainability. They are running the, the radio program completely on their own now. This is without external resources at all. There's been participation, including of women, accountability, and people are coming to see this, so South-South cooperation. So I'd say it's a good example uh, you know, of a good practice. Not perfect, but, but good. Well, thank you all for sharing your expertise this evening. And thank you to the Asia Society and the Asia Foundation for hosting this. And thank you all. And I hope you'll join us at the reception following this panel uh, for further discussion. Thank you.